Welcome to App Center, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Crane, and I'm here with Sunny Agarwal. So today we are going to do the second part of a long episode we did with Amir Taki, Rosa O'Leary, and Ivan Yelinchich. So this is episode 424. If you have not listened to 423, the first part of this conversation, you know, I recommend you do that and you start there. Uh, and you listen to all of them together, but it was really fantastic conversation and I really enjoyed it. So they are working on a project called Dark Fi, basically trying to bring privacy uh, to DeFi. So before we go into the second part of the episode, uh, we would like to share a few words about our sponsors this week. So first of all, we have Gnosis. So digital assets today on Web3 are usually controlled by a single private key. But that poses a challenge because when a private key is lost or compromised, then all the funds are gone. The Gnosis Safe solves this problem. Gnosis Safe is a smart wallet that enables users to control digital assets with much more granular permission, involving multiple private keys, a subset of which is required for executing transactions. So these keys can then be stored in different hardware or software wallets, or even shared across multiple people. Gnosis saves extra layer of security and personalization, make it the most trusted Web3 asset management solution for individuals, teams, and DAOs. A lot of DAOs using Gnosis Safe. And in total, already more than $100 billion worth of digital assets are stored on the Gnosis Safe today. Uh, on top of that, Gnosis Safe also provides the opportunity for developers to plug into the platform and build their own dApps and permission modules. So visit gnosis-safe.io to learn more and get started setting up your own safe. And second of all, we have Tally. So Tally is a new wallet for Web3 and DeFi that sees the wallet as a public good. Think of it like a community-owned alternative to MetaMask. It has all the features of MetaMask, but the difference is that Tally is 100% open source under the GPL v3 license. And it's 100% user owned with all the profits flowing back to the community, not a corporation. The launch of Tally is coming in the new year, but the team have just released an early version of the community to the community, the Tally community edition before the DAO launches. You know, what features are in your idea wallet? What annoys you about your current, current wallet? Try out Tally, join the community on Discord, they have community calls uh, each week with you know hundreds of people joining and you know get involved. So all of the info you need is at tally.cash. That's T-A-L-L-Y dot cash. And with that, let's go to our episode. So, you know, one of the other challenges I know with like AMMs in Xernology, because because so, you know, I've spent a lot of time doing research on this as well. I'm not really a cryptographer. My co-founder is. And so he, you know, understands this way better than me. But like a lot of DeFi today requires shared state. And with Xernology systems, you usually, you know, it's a, you, you can design non-UTXO zero knowledge systems, but it's like, you know, it's, it's a good mental model to think about it in where like when you're making a zero knowledge transaction, you need to know the state that you're about to apply your transaction to. And that basically turns into a world where maybe everyone can only do only one transaction per block can be uh, executed like like on that touches a, a piece of shared state. So you have one AMM and 10 people want to try to trade on it only one of them can so for osmosis you know our, our, which is what project i work on what our, our solution was say like hey the amm sits outside of the sh outside of the privacy system and we instead just have a shielded pool uh like uh zcash style shielded pool and whenever someone wants to do a trade assets pop out of the shielded uh pool hit the AMM, do the swap, and then come straight back into the shielded pool. And then the user's wallets should just automatically roll over their um, addresses. So our solution was, hey, ignore the hard problem. Let's do the simple problem, which is just have, you know, at the asset layer in zero knowledge and not the smart contract. Because to do most of the interesting smart contracts that require shared state, from what we understood, we need like even more advanced cryptography techniques like MPC and stuff to uh, make them work. So is that stuff you're also like thinking about as well? 
I just I just jump in quickly and then I'm going to pass to Amir. Um so I think that like you're completely right in everything you've outlined. Um AMM is kind of like a paradox within CK. It basically cannot be done without um de-anonymizing the amounts or the participants. So um uh we have to evolve new concepts, but I think that uh, zero knowledge is a unique opportunity to do that. And the reason why is like there's this really generative uh, role that constraints play uh, in design. So um, DeFi itself came from, unlike AMMs themselves, came from engineering, you know, within a set of constraints, um, which the constraint in that case is like, how do we do order books in a way which is like peer to peer um, and decentralized? And, and that's where like, okay, we can use this curve. You know, that's where that idea came from. So I think, you know, over time, we will see the same kind of thinking happening within the ZK space. Um, and as opposed to being a kind of restrictive thing, it could actually blow open new ways of uh, thinking about finance. We need a field of ZK Fi, like a redesigning of all these DeFi primitives to like work within the zero knowledge world and constraints and such. Yeah, we just call it dark Fi. <laughs> Yeah, as you mentioned, you alluded to MPC, which is one way of uh, updating the state. So um, all these techniques can work together. Um, as Rose said, the I like to call it isomorphisms with TradFi. That's what DeFi is. It's like we're trying to explore how do we port these TradFi concepts over. Um, I think the, the blockchain algos are getting a lot faster. So the whole kind of order book constraint is becoming like less of a problem. Um, but ZK introduced like a different set of constraints. And actually the order book model is better for, for ZK than uh, the AMM uh, that can be implemented in, inside of ZK um, as, as well as a, a liquidation engine. Uh, so you can have a leverage uh, fully anonymized leverage, but there's also other kind of market mechanisms, you know, where, you know, for people to buy and sell on the market. It's not just restricted to, you know, uh, central limit order books and AMMs. So, you know, um, so that's kind of something we just have to essentially prototype into many products, build them, see what gains traction, how do people adapt, and and, and tried many different designs. You know, I have literally, I have like uh, uh, four different designs in my head about things that I want to try out. And so, is this dark fi? Do you see this as like a new um, smart contract blockchain, kind of similar to like you have, you know, Ethereum and Solana and you know others, or is this more some sort of zero knowledge tech that will plug into different? blockchains and or and, and if it's a smart contract shop, will this be like a proof of stake blockchain or his own staking mechanism or like like yeah what's what this going to look like so one of the first products that we're actually kind of gearing up to make will be a, a DAO like an anonymous DAO and actually uh, we're going to make probably use Tendermint uh, BFT for that um, and Tendermint's cool because it's got the IBC into blockchain protocol what essentially is like the blockchain is not our focus. We might inside of our toolkit provide a blockchain that people can use in their products and then, and then bridges that people can use to connect these blockchains together. Uh, but the, yeah, the, the Cosmos model, um, you know, uh, NIM is using Tendermint on the back end. Zcash is switching to Tendermint. You know, so that's more like the crypto way that I feel. Okay, that's very cool. Yeah, so basically it could be sort of a, its own blockchain and then you just use IBC to send assets over and then you can do, you know, privacy, like you can do things there and then take them out again. Yeah, I will say quickly that um, it's similar to uh, something like ETH, which is generic, um, you know, EVM with like programmable smart contracts. Um, but it's different in that, um, you know, we're, we're very much committed to the, the philosophy of Unix. So we want, we want to make 
like small, like modular tooling, which can be composed um, together um, to create projects. Um, so like Amir said, like you can kind of like plug in um, the blockchain, but you could also just use the contracts on another chain, which maybe that's what the day we're working on now will do as we don't have the blockchain yet. Um, and similarly, you can just, so the, the things ideally are like separate tools that can be co composed together in a very flexible way. That's really cool. That's like awesome to see that, you know, I think, that, I think, yeah, I agree. Like it seems like Cosmos is sort of becoming this like spot where a lot of like cool privacy stuff is being built. You guys should also check out Anoma. They're like another really cool project that's doing a lot of cool stuff with, uh, you know, zero knowledge, um, also built on Cosmos. Um, yeah. So, you know, Amir, you, you, you were also mentioning earlier about this like free Assange DAO that uh, you're, you're, you want to help create. What are your plans with that? Uh, I'm working with uh, Assange's brother, uh, who they've actually been planning to release an NFT for a while now. And um, then the free Ross style happened, which was set up to bid on the Ross Ulbricht NFT. And they actually raised, um, I think it was four and a half K ETH, uh, and it made a bid of, of 1K, which it won the auction with. So all of that money that it raised was 14 million, which is a, is a pretty big victory for kind of Ross Ulbricht, who um, was one of the initial heroes of crypto, um, has done, done so much for the space, and now is in prison for life. Um, and uh, yeah, and then uh, Assange's brother, uh, he's been for ages trying to find a way to because Assange is essentially broke, he spent all the bitcoins that he got in, in a long time ago, and now he's just relying on uh, lawyers helping him for free, which, you know, essentially you get what you pay for, and his extradition now has just been approved to the US, um, so he's, he's facing imminent extradition, it just needs the foreign secretary of the US, Priti Patel, to sign the order, essentially. Um, and he, he just literally had a stroke a few days ago on the right side of his face. Um, so nasty, nasty stuff. Um, uh, so I, I think, uh, yeah, we have a very solid chance there to raise, you know, 20 million in this DAO to give to Assange. The DAO is, uh, is very interesting because um, a lot of uh, big names I know in tech have joined the kind of Telegram group, and there's a, a lot of enthusiasm for it. You know, people are very, very active, and then, um, you know, we're kind of setting up that DAO now, and, and the initial version will literally just be, you know, put something out on ETH, uh, on Ethereum, um, you know, so that the family, when they list the NFTs, there's a way for people to pull capital to fractionalize the NFTs, to bid on them. So the DAO will like then give shares of the NFTs that it is won back to the people who have invested in the DAO, which is the same model that the Free Ross DAO made. So um, DAOs are very interesting politically. Um, the you know uh, and, and maybe Rose can say more about this, but a few years ago um, there was a lot of talk about DAOs as as this like political formation which you know was just talk but it's we've seen in like literally the last year or so that like now DAOs have started to gain like a lot of traction um also uh, the original conception of DAOs was uh, there'd be a this autonomous organization in the internet that would be like hiring people and be like uh, uh running running like by itself and autonomous uh but the, but DAOs have actually shifted in, in nature to be more focused around uh, ways for people to organize in this uh, post-corporate kind of democratic squad slash tribal structure and, you know, diffuse liability and, and act as a collective. So that's an interesting evolution of the DAO concept, um, which has coincided with like the kind of takeoff of DAOs. And the interesting thing about Assange is like, okay, that now 
like DAOs, which have been main, mainly confined to like financial project. Now there's this kind of like strong convergence of kind of cypherpunks uh, using their kind of like knowledge and their means to free like the original cypherpunk who was like Assange. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's I, I think, uh, a signal in the noise of like what's coming. Yeah, I completely agree with Amir. And I'll just add, I, I think his point about the DAOs is interesting, like how the earliest kind of DAOs, like we saw the DAO on Ethereum, it was very much this kind of, um, this old Zaboian language of uh, like unstoppable uh, glacial code, you know, like this this code is law kind of stuff. And and the, the DAOs in the early days, they were, visions as, they were envisioned as these kind of um, uh, almost like sentient, AI kind of actors, you know, um, that were like inhuman and uh, and autonomous, and it was it was kind of scary almost the way that they were described. But now we've seen in the past year or so, um, actually this shift to, to set DAOs, you know, emerging and, and and much more of a social phenomena than uh, I think people had expected. And increasingly, you know, we're seeing now with the with the free Ross and the free Assange uh, DAO a really interesting tool for uh, coordinated activism. Yeah, I'm very bullish on the DAO space. I can imagine that this is also something somewhere where like the zero knowledge and privacy is important, where it's like, you know, especially for something like you know the uh, Assange DAO, where it would be like, you know. I don't want, maybe I don't want my government to know that I'm like contributing to like, to this kind of thing, but like, this is something I want to do regardless. Right. And that, I think that's important, but you know, on the flip side, you know, I guess wrapping it all the way back around to the beginning, like, you know, there's the, what about like, is, are there cases where, you know, over privacy is an issue where let's say like the ability to contribute to these, like, um, you know, movement uh, is good in, in certain cases like this. But like, if we're talking about like political funding, for example, like, you know, it would be, I think people appreciate a level of transparency in knowing where, you know, certain people in power get their um, donations from and like who, so, we, you know, if, if if bribery is a inherent part of the world we live in, it's at least nice to be able to see where the strings are, who and what's pulling the strings rather than not even having any visibility into that at all. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And if you read a lot of the literature on DAOs, um, there is a big emphasis on, you know, transparency, you know, at the level of like uh, corporations and, and, and governments and that kind of thing. Um, and I, I, I do think that uh, so transparency in some cases is okay. And actually you can make DAOs which combine, you know, things like anonymity for the users with transparency of the finances, for example. Um, so it's not to say that building uh, anonymous tooling and necessarily means that every single aspect has to be anonymous, although in some cases it should be. Um, you know, for some of these DAOs, like say it's a DAO operating a city or something, you might actually want that the that the expenditures are public, um, but the people might be might be hidden, or you might have other ways of customizing that, and you can. But I, it's it's the problem with the current kind of transparency maximalism that we have is basically um, everything is exposed, but the most sensitive thing is, is I think probably that the users are exposed. Um, and yeah, that, that's, that's probably the most important thing to solve. Yeah. I, I would add as well that, um, uh, during the, uh, Russian war, they, uh, they put out a competition for people to like design the next gun for the, for the Russian army. And there are a lot of uh, uh, really well-funded, you know, big names, scientific engineering teams that were like designing these guns. And uh, Kalashnikov, he was just like a, um, a guy that, that uh, what do you call it, like the people who know about like meth, using the tools to make, to do things with metal. Um, and he was in the hospital bed and he was thinking about his experience in the war like about the guns, like everything that he he found that he saw was wrong with them, 
And he was thinking, like, if only there was like a tour that was like this and like this. And he started to design it. And he went around everywhere trying to get people uh, to, to, to form his team so that he could go in this, the competition and win the competition. And nobody wanted to give him resources. And, and, uh, but he, he found like a few allies and some guy gave him a corner of the factory. And he produced the, the Kalashnikov and he won the competition. And then the, the Kalashnikov, it's like, it's no coincidence that it's, it's like the symbol on, if you look at many flags of liberation movements or flags of, you know, um, uh, of, of even nations, uh, they have a picture of a Kalashnikov because it was a tool that like tipped the balance uh, in favor or, which, which allowed many different like rebel movements to kind of exist and, and to like uh, uh, fight for their interests that would not otherwise been able to exist, you know. So, yeah, so the Kalashnikov kind of, it ushered in this, um, you know, and I, I talked before about uh, automated weapons, um, which I think is like the real kind of danger to humanity, which is this scenario where, you know, the human soul is completely subjugated and, you know, we lose our ability to, we, use, we lose our free speech, we lose our ability as, as, um, as consumers in a market, you know, they're talking about CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, centralization of the financial infrastructure, and social credit scoring, which the, the Western states are trying to copy with the CBDCs. They're inspired by the China model. Uh, the courts, you know, like I was reading an article where it was saying, you know, when you go to a local court, it's good to have someone who has like a local lawyer because they know how to talk to the local judges, which the local judge might, might, might judge you uh, badly because you don't know the decorum. So what kind, of, what kind of legal system is that, which, is, which has become so detached from notions of justice? You know, uh, and I talked about censorship, uh, the, you know, the, the calls for Facebook, for, you know, the media to toe a line. Um, uh, so what is the last avenue of defense of, of human freedom, like, you know, and, and at what cost? And even that freedom is being taken away from us now. So, um, so I, I think the, you know, we need we need the the means to preserve ourselves as as human beings, as you know, human in, uh, individuals in a society, uh, because um, that's being encroached on now. Um, the outcome is, I don't I don't believe this uh, the. The, so I, I like that the, there is all this uh, public goods focus in Ethereum. You know, I love the whole kind of ideas around uh, collective ownership, DAOs, um, you know, people power. That's incredible. But the other side of ETH, which is, you know, making this alliance with regulators, you know, they, they really try to kind of bring the WEF into kind of bed with them. Uh, but then Gary Gensler like turned on them, so they kind of got burned. Uh, that that's a huge mistake. That's like literally cluing up your competitor. I, I don't I don't believe this uh, kind of optimism of power that they they kind of have. Um, so I, I think like there is like this tension that's like irresolvable, and actually the the ultimately. The, the swing of history is like in favor of our side. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, and, it's, and it's, it's healthy that we kind of uh, push to like realize, you know, the, the realization of these tools to their fullest extent. Um, like those of us, the, there is, there is going to be this kind of choppy period. You know, I liken it to there's a storm coming and we, we have a lifeboat and like crypto is our lifeboat to like cross the storm. 
uh, you know, people are going to like fall off of their lifeboat, you know, people are going to fall in the sea. But ultimately, like the place that we get to is, is, is going to be something very special. We're going to go somewhere, we're going to arrive somewhere, which is going to like the, the, the people that escaped persecution in Europe, you know, okay, maybe that's not a great example, you know, of everybody going to the US, but, you know, um, they went there, they got given land, you know, they, they, they got ownership for the first time in their lives. And what I see around me happening now is people, everybody is becoming so poor. And when I say that to crypto people, they go, what are you talking about? Everybody's becoming rich. And it's like, yeah, in crypto, everyone is becoming rich. But in the real world, everybody is becoming really, really poor. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of frightening that you see happening. And um, also during the coronavirus, uh, I watched uh, a lot of sci-fi, like a lot, a lot of sci-fi. And the interesting thing is that the movies from the 90s, um, they have, uh, you know, uh, what the, the White House being blown up by aliens in Independence Day. You have Godzilla destroying New York. You have uh, the, the tsunami uh, uh, washing everything away the day after tomorrow. And it was like, it's like, okay, the Soviet Union, it's gone. Like, we're, we're supreme now. We're on top. Okay, what do we want? Like, and people started imagining, like, you know, the apocalypse coming. And then we got 9-11, like the Twin Towers. And it was like, uh, it was like, we were so fascinated by that vision of the future that the Al-Qaeda saw it as a great marketing opportunity. And they were like, cool, like that's something that, and it was it, in terms of like damage done, like people killed, it, like, it, wasn't, it wasn't like a huge number of people. I mean, like, I don't want to say, but, but compared to the population of the US, it wasn't something that crippled the US, but we can see now, it's like visible to be, be seen, like that it had a huge impact on politics, you know, massive. It's like, it was a victory for the Islamists. And it's the same thing now with the movies that we're seeing come out now, the sci-fi movies. They're so brooding, they're so apocalyptic. Like there's, there's always like, in, in most of them I see in the, in the future, there's been some kind of disaster event, you know? And it's like, everybody is like expecting something to happen. Like in, in, in the next five years or so, everybody feels, you know, there's, there's, there's gonna be this big, we don't know what it is, there's gonna be like a, there's a major political, economic event, something's gonna happen, you know? And it's like, and so, you know, that's where crypto is situated, you know, and it's crypto's job is to, like, I mean, those of us that are building with crypto is to be on the right side of history, because ultimately that's what it is. And, and, and you know, trying to fly under the radar, those elements of crypto will eventually, they will just get stamped out of existence by the state, you know, because it's, it always happens like this in history, you know, the, 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 there's a feedback loop of rhetoric, you know, things reach a pe uh, fever pitch, you know, and the more that the, the state is going to, this, this is actually Rose's thesis, I'm saying, but the more that the state cracks, cracks down on crypto, the more it radicalizes people, and so it creates this loop, and that's the, the inevitable tendency. I'll just, like, add to what he said about, I'll, I'll just summarize a little quickly my thesis, which is, which is basically, like, we have this super cycle, and super cycle is a bet on regfi, you know, so it's like, the idea of the super cycle is everyone's got really rich because Pepsi's going to have NFTs and, you know, the U.S. government is going to use Bitcoin or something. And so that's like the super cycle thesis uh, simplified. So it entails the existence of reg, regfi. But the thing about regfi is that regfi also necessitates de darkfi because regfi is uh, like a heavily policed restricted area where you can only enter if you have the right nationality and everything you do within there is contained and you, you're, you have to pay tax on everything. And so uh, liquidity is going to spill out into the technology which offers something closer to what we're used to in crypto now, which will be, you know, we call it dark fi. Um, and then we have this split like that's happened between the cryptocurrency in industry. It's basically split in the middle. We have the reg fi and dark fi. Um, so what happens next is this kind of this cycle where, you know, the state tries to restrict Darkfi, it tries to crack down on Darkfi. Um, 
but that is simultaneously reinforcing its its it's justifying its ex, ex, its ex, existence. So the people that have been restricted to this zone of dark fi are increasingly rad radicalized and increasingly alienated from this reg fi system. So it's actually actually the catalyst for their uh, political autonomy and self determination process to occur. Um, so I'm quite bullish on you know this this differentiation between uh dark fi and, and and the kind of current paradigm of surveillance um i think it's a really important process and i think it's um it's ultimately very positive um for society one topic i was also curious about um so you know this dark fi now right but of course amir has had previous projects before there was dark wallet and then there was this thing called dark market a uh, dark market was this kind of, you know, anonymous eBay style thing in a hackathon. And then there was actually some people's, and it seemed like, okay, obviously the use case would be something like a decentralized Silk Road. And then you had a bunch of people who basically uh, then started this open bazaar, right? Which was kind of the same idea, but I, I think so at least on the surface, targeting more this use case of, you know, some sort of global eBay and, you know, people would sell like mugs and stuff like that. But still, in a way, it all seems kind of weird because you had in 2011 already, right, Silk Road, there was a lot of usage of Silk Road. Like people really like wanted a product like that. And even when Bitcoin was, you know, obscure people actually use that you know more than anything else and so in a way it's like the it seemed like the dark market idea of like okay decentralizing these marketplaces for like you know physical goods and physical shipments such an obvious thing to do and it seemed like okay there would be like huge demand for this kind of stuff and I'm curious, like, yeah, what what are your thoughts on this? Do you still think this is like an important problem? Uh, what is the state of this kind of world? I'll address both parts of of what you said, uh, but let's start with the second part. Um, dark market, um, which was originally announced in Toronto several years ago, was a prototype. I was working on Dark Wallet, so you know we we made the prototype in in one night for the hackathon, um, and you know we we put it out, and then I forgot about the project, and there was a petition in the community at the time. So if people look at the Dark Wallet video, um, the original Dark Wallet video where we crowdfunded. 60k to fund dark wallet development oh yeah brilliant and um not many people realize but at the time we were the minority voice now it's trendy now it's like everybody's like yeah cypherpunks cypherpunks right code but at the time there was a lot of people in the crypt in the bitcoin community going oh we need mass adoption we need big banks and, like why is amir bringing so much heat and I was like the fly in the pudding because, um, you know, journalists would, would love me and I'd go, oh, blah, blah. And I'd, I'd be like ruining, I'd be spoiling the whole kind of corporate kind of uh, co-option process that, that this kind of, that people were trying to assemble or construct around Bitcoin. Was that on purpose? Like, were you purposely trying to destroy that? Yes, because the Bitcoin Foundation... Uh, so I was, so the initial uh, Bitcoin.org website, there was a list of five names. I was one of the original five that was on there, but it was Gavin Andreessen who was afraid of like, of, of up and coming young devs like myself, who were like vying for his position, who tried to like push those kind of people out. And I became, I was like the first to suffer from that. And so I kind of saw like, that there was this cabal of developers that were trying to like kind of seize control of Bitcoin. And that's why we made the, the BIP process was to, to kind of put breaks because the way, because I came from uh, open source background 
I was also a professional poker player for two years. And, um, and, and so inside of open source world, I understood about uh, community, like where Ivan comes from as well. We were part of the whole anarcho, you know, hacker, uh, free software, you know, guys working on Linux, like hardcore for many years. Uh, so um, we kind of, um, we understood software development in, in, terms of, in terms of that idea, which is like the way that you build your software has to be uh, modular. It has, you have to, you know, expose the inner parts of the technology. Um, you know, it, it favors like elegance and simplicity of design because you want the whole, the whole technology stack to be transparent. Whereas Gavin Andreessen and those kind of guys, they came from like a corporate background. So in the corporate background, it's about making products for end users, for consumers. So they want to integrate the entire technology stack. They don't want to like diffuse it. And the emphasis is not on simplicity, it's on perfection, it's on completeness. So there was this clash of ideology inside of Bitcoin. And, um, and, and, and so that's why I, I forked off and I started working on Lip Bitcoin. But, uh, and, and, and that's why also, you know, we saw what was happening with um, the Bitcoin thing. And we were like, no, this is like why Bitcoin was invented, because there was a big shift in, in Bitcoin from 2010, 2011, where you would go on the forums and there would be everybody all day long talking about Austrian economics, sound money, you know, uh, the, cent the evil central bank uh, agorism you know, uh, overthrow the state. It was like, that was literally the Bitcoin talk forums. And then, you know, these guys started to come along and you'd see them bit first. And I'd see, I'd even meet them in real life and people would go to me, um, they would say to me something like, you know, you are an expert on creating software. I am an expert on marketing. And in the way that we do marketing, blah, blah, blah. And they're like trying to school me on how I should talk to the media going, you know, it's not good what you say because you might scare people away from the project. It's like, dude, like, you know, people use Bitcoin because Bitcoin's cool because that's like, you know, ultimately, like, I don't care about like passive consumers. You know, I've heard the argument we could hide, hide in the noise. I don't buy it. I think you, you're simply just like, you're simply just opening, you're opening the door to uh, allow takeover. You know, the, the type of people you surround yourself is, is critical, is key. And, the re and people who want to do things in life, people who have like ambition and sense of purpose, they see something that has like, has its ability to, you know, strike paths or like to create new paths. You know, like when you're walking through, through nature and, you know, you, you want to get to somewhere and the path hasn't been tread on and you have to tread the grass and then, and then other people do that and it creates a new path, you know. So... That was what was happening to Bitcoin development and uh, the dark market, uh, there was a petition on the Reddit. If you search petition dark market, you'll find people made a petition. They were saying this is a community petition for Amir to rename dark market to open to open bazaar. You know, that we, dis that we as a community disagree with how this one developer has created a software like uh, with uh, a branding that, that is against our will. So there, there, was, so there was that attitude in the community. Like it's, it's different now. Like I can safely say now that DeFi is cypherpunk. Like DeFi is like the, the original will of crypto. That's why I'm, I'm not long Ethereum Foundation. I'm long DeFi and DAOs. Like that's, that's where the future lies, you know? And um, so yeah, uh, Dark Market got rebranded to Open Bazaar. You know, also, um, you know, they wanted to change the, li uh, the license from GPL. I'm a GPL guy, you know, like, fuck the corporates if they want to use my shit. Like, they have to also publish their source code open source as well. You know, a lot of uh, open source devs think it's a victory when they write free software and it gets used by, like, Google or Apple for, and, and they get nothing back. I think that's just, like, a victim mindset like Stockholm syndrome. So anyway, they, they, got me, they, they, they got me to change the, they sent me a letter saying, can you change the license? I said, all right, yeah, I don't care. Here, it's MIT, whatever. And then the next thing they did after that is they went to 
Andreessen Horowitz, and they started to get VC funding from A16Z. For people who don't know A16Z, there's like two groups of VCs in crypto world. There's like cool VCs, which are like young people, which are crypto native. We know we all come from like, you know, either the, the early Bitcoin generation or the later one, doesn't matter, you know, but they, we embody like the same ideal. And then there's like the, the, the Silicon Valley guys who they're friends with other people in Silicon Valley and, and they're friends with people in the banks and they get cheap money, you know, the money that's printed by the central banks, it doesn't go to the hands of people, it goes to other big banks who give it to their buddies. And, so there are, and then the buddies in Silicon Valley, they get this, this dollars, which they got for cheap. And then they give it to crypto projects and crypto projects give pieces of their work. So the, the hardworking developer, he works hard. And you know, you know, like Marx, Marx came along and he said, look, this is how much money you're making. You know, uh, this is how much you get. This is how much, you know, the capitalists get. Like, let's organize and take that, that thing over. Let's, Let's run it ourselves. And that's my proposal to developers now. It's like, you know, let's, let's take that over. Like, why are we giving ourselves pieces of our work to the big guys? And uh, so Andreessen, so all these big VC firms, you know, they, they all talk in a certain way because they're connected to the state. They all act in a certain way. And the interesting thing is you see a lot of uh, projects, especially in the bull, bull market phase, um, where there's a lot of, like, money flowing into the crypto ecosystem, have very bland... Uh, branding, they're very generic, they're very safe looking, you know, they're not like stepping on anyone's toes. And um, the interesting thing is that pressure, that conformity pressure, it doesn't come from the market. The market actually desires cool stuff, like the, the market like desires like, you know, disruption and, and like, you know, um, differentiation and diversity. Like that's why we watch movies about heroes prevailing against all odds, you know, David and Goliath. It's like thousands of years old. Like it's something that speaks to us internally. Um, but this, this, this pressure, it's coming from this network in, that's largely based in the US to conform. And so that's what happened to Open Bazaar. You know, they, they started to add all this censorship tech to like censor pages and stuff. And, uh, you know, they, they start the way that they were like, orientating their phrasing was going oh you know it's like it's like um ebay but you know we make uh kind of predilections about the spheres of activity that are enabled or not enabled so for example uh ethereum ethereum when it came up they said let's just make tooling for developers the developers will use it in any way that they see fit and that was the power of ETH that, that kind of turned it into a, a, a generative ecosystem. So in terms of uh, generative ecosystems, if you are there and you are, are constraining this like emergent life form that's like exploring, you know, into what, what Rose was talking about, this, this dark space with its kind of tendrils, and you're like cutting them off and you're saying, no, there is a path that has already been created and you can only go this way. And then essentially you're, you're preordaining the destiny of that technology, you know, um, and, and that ties into what you started saying, which is, um, you know, the, the whole uh, uh, philosophy of the agorists, which the agorists were saying, and it comes down to this concept of economic simulation, which is, you know, we are the economic simulations as a, as a form of uh, as a form of of this of organization of um, you know like quantifying the unquantifiable that which existed before. For example, I used to be an open source developer for many years. We created tremendous amounts of value for society. The problem was, was that we had no way to capture back some of that value that we created. And the, and the power of tokenization, which a lot of people are strangely in Ethereum Foundation, they seem against like DeFi and markets. They seem like anti-markets. We're pro-markets. We think like this is a hugely generative tool. 
it's like there for us to to explore and to use. You know, we can create simul these we can create these simulations that the the participants in DAOs in DeFi protocols can themselves uh, prefigure their own destinies, like destinies that that we as the that then like not me as a boss, but as as a as and an you and and everybody else that we can through our, through this intellectual culture that we have through the the ideas, the memes, the memes. Um, the images, the symbols, the stories, the narratives that we can that we direct our energies, you know. And the whole thing was is uh, the crypto anarchists in the origin they said uh, cryptography is this new tool which we can use to make parallel societies where um, the the oppressed, where you know anybody who is marginalised, uh, people on the fringes. Uh, they can they can start to meet and they can start to organize and they can start to realize their visions of the future and the, not only that the code the DNA of this of these new forms of organization it, it's it's immune by default to all forms of um, totalitarianism that it's it's like um, for example, well, you know, like some organisms that they 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 they're like naturally antibacterial just because of their biological makeup. That this kind of organizations are like anti-totalitarian, and that these form the seed of of the new type of civilization. Just to interject briefly, uh, what makes those types of organization anti-totalitarian? We have to think that the reason why people use uh, Bitcoin, the reason why people use uh, cryptocurrency is because um, they have some will, they have some intent of what they want to do. And crypto is kind of the path of least resistance. So, for example, um, you know, uh, crypto, it's not easy to use right now yet. Yeah. You know, I went to, for example, Lebanon recently. And in Lebanon, they have lots of small exchange shops that are trading Tron USDT. They're like literally, and, and we talk about mass adoption of Bitcoin, but it turns out maybe it's Tron that actually realized that. And I was talking about these, these paths through the wilderness that we create. So, you know, going off the beaten path into the wilderness, you know, there's like brambles, there's like bits, there's like nature around you. It's, you have to like, you know, push it out the way, you have to crush it down. You know, it's not convenient. Yet, here we are, there are people that are, are choosing to walk through the brambles to get cut because there is some reason that bring them to crypto. And I asked to you like to look, and think to yourself, like, why specifically crypto? What is it's, it's not because, you know, they can buy a coffee with cryptocurrency and saying, oh, it's cheaper to buy a coffee. There's some reason there. And, and that, that's, that, that reasoning is what we should explore further. I wanted to address Brian's question a little bit. So I think crypto definitely has the capacity for totalitarianism, you know, as does any technology. Um, but technology contains like two potentialities basically there's like an authoritarian strand uh within technology but there's also this kind of democratic strand um so like we will see probably both authoritarian uh crypto systems like china style uh social credit uh, uh scoring combined with non-authoritarian democratic techniques um you know, as we're seeing like emerging in the DAO space. Um, so there's this kind of joint um, history of technology. And Mir, he mentioned earlier on that, you know, we, we have this analysis where we look back in history and we see there was two types of civilization. There was the democratic civilization, the state-based one, and these have been in conflict throughout history. Um, well, there's another philosopher, Lewis Mumford, who looks at that history and he says, that's not a war between politics or forms of organization. 
it's actually a technological war that's playing out between two forms of technology. One that he calls megatechnics uh, or monotechnics and the other which he calls polytechnics, democratic techniques. So you can have both things. Um, but, you know, the legacy that we're coming from is is one of user empowerment. Um, and, and so the characteristics of like democratic um, technology is uh, it's owned and operated uh, by people in service of their needs uh, instead of, uh, in the case of megatechnics, uh, users being uh, exploited as tools within this kind of inhuman uh, apparatus. Uh, so one, the other example would be like something like Facebook, where the users are essentially enslaved within the system. Uh, everything about the software is 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 built to capture their attention and their time, uh, and they're literally being harvested, like farmed. For, for, for their data and their attention. Um, and they have no voice or control over that system. So this is like the same um, hierarchy and like uh, enslavement relation that Richard Stallman talked about um, so many years ago in his critique of proprietary software when he first like um, spoke of free software, introduced free software. You know, he noticed that um, that if you have a system where there's the users and then there's the developers. That's an abusive uh, relation uh, because you have a class of people on top who are making decisions based off of these this user base, which is locked out of the code. Um, so we have that now brought to you unprecedented, unimaginable extremes in this surveillance uh, paradigm exemplified by these Web2 uh, kind of technologies. Whereas, you know, crypto is, is offering an alternative. At the moment, it's still transparent, but at least in crypto, you know, people uh, control their own destiny and, and, and users control their own data and their own activities. So that's a, that's a fundamental shift in the way of thinking about technology, I think, orientating towards more democratic as opposed to authoritarian lines. Um, so, Amir, you mentioned that you see that the Ethereum Foundation is starting to become more anti-market. And so, you know, for listeners who might not be, you know, I think many people might not be aware of like sort of your role, you know, you were quite involved with sort of the early stages of Ethereum and not like actively in the project, but like if, if I remember correctly, were you, I think someone told me that you were the one that actually introduced uh, Vitalik to Gavin. Um, I don't know if that's correct or not, but like, you know, you were very involved and, you know, very, you know, I guess part of that like initial movement that helped create Ethereum, what, what, what is it about, you know, the Ethereum foundation that you see is starting to maybe diverge from the view, the original visions that you may have aligned with? Okay. So yeah, you're the only person who really knows about that but um most people don't know much about crypto's early history um so ethereum as it started was it, it started it started off as um you know um socially conscious technically minded people who uh saw the potential to generalize Bitcoin a lot further. Honestly, I when I was hearing about ETH in the early days, um, I, what I didn't really understand, like what it could be used for, like I, no, nobody could give me practical examples. So that is uh, a very good example of the kind of intuitive mindset winning over the observant. I'm like a bit maybe too observant sometimes which is the Jungian kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, but as ETH has kind of developed, um, it, it never really had a strong vision of what it wanted to be. It was kind of like, oh, you know, like here, you just kind of, you, people just kind of make whatever. We just give like a, a, a base layer. And yes, that was, was good, but like, where we can see that heading now is the the uh, the community is becoming immensely fragmented. Uh, if if community is still, I think the most 
interesting or you know powerful kind of crypto community you know uh, bitcoin has lost its edge completely all the smart people have left um you know solana it's it's, it's very it's very inorganic it's vc led and if you look at solana breakpoint the types of people that were there but eve community it's like um, you know, a lot of very smart, interesting people. But where I see it heading now is um, the, there is fragmentation that is happening. Especially there is a lot of uh, L2s that are popping up. And all of these L2s are kind of vying to become the next Ethereum, essentially. Um, and, and then also Polkadot is also a branch of the ETH community. So uh, Ethereum is essentially, um, there are many different groups now that are emerging. Uh, DeFi as an entire ph phenomena is um, emerging outside of the influence of Ethereum Foundation. Uh, Ethereum Foundation has kind of lost a lot of its soft power. So um, yeah, so if really doesn't have like a strong sense of like, what it wants to be, where it wants to go. They try to kind of, because um, for example, like um, if you look at Vitalik's blog or you, or you like look at his, his talks, he will talk about a lot of different things like, oh, there's this voting mechanism or oh, there's this thing that's interesting, but they're just, it's just like trivia. There's no like, overarching theme that kind of tie these pieces together into like a coherent kind of you know uh, uh, direction that can like pull people in and that's actually the, the role that Ethereum Foundation should be playing. The Ethereum Foundation should not be like actually directly involved in you know like shaping the projects you know or you know like uh, managing the development of the software actually it should be like kind of steering the over overarching direction and you know inviting in uh, uh, people to collaborate on the philosophy and developing the intellectual culture but that dimension it's largely missing from ethereum uh, they tried to fill it in with this uh, uh, radical market stuff but the guy glenn Weil, he's um he's completely from the system, like he was educated at Stanford. I met him twice actually, he doesn't remember meeting me the first time, uh, but I asked him both times if he knew about Rajava, which is the most interesting political experiment in the world right now. And if you're a political scientist, you should know about that, but he had never heard of it. So the only people who never heard about Rajava that are into politics, are essentially people that are like so embedded in the system into like liberalism and it's also a guy that he goes to like the wef he speaks at davos so this was like kind of the tilt that ethereum was trying to position itself as was going oh we're the more kind of like friendly uh version to bitcoin which bitcoin is like anti-regulator we're like willing to work with the regulators but then it didn't work out because, you know, Gary Gensler like flipped on them and they kind of got cucked. So then there's this been this vacuum and the DeFi kind of phenomena is like emerged out of that. And uh, as I said, it started off with like animal, animal coins and scam projects and all kinds of crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, but then uh, it's, it's like slowly finding its way. Um, the inter and it's interesting because, you know, there's this tendency towards, because like Rose said, there's these two visions of technology that are at play. And you can kind of see it in, um, you know, the, all the like surveillance apparatus on the one side, but then the other side, like all the kind of like, uh, you know, like the Arab Spring and the color revolutions where, you know, people organized through the internet as a swarm and it was like, you know, um, uh, people uh, uh, moving together using these modern technologies to to change the the world that they exist in around them, and 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 that's like that's like the human empowerment vision of technology. But the other one is the top-down vision of technology, which ETH is, or especially ETH 
from ETH core is very much still like uh, integrated into this mindset. So, uh, for example, uh, Claros, uh, the talk in FCC uh, by Federico, uh, he's actually talking about how, uh, you know, Foucault, when he spoke about the Panopticon, uh, he misrepresented the Panopticon because the Panopticon was good as originally envisioned. It was like a decentralized form of surveillance. And that entire movement come out of like, and they, they actually came up to me, and I posted about this on Twitter and the Claros guys, they came up to me in Lisbon and they said like, oh, hey, like you misunderstood like what we were saying. You know, the, I, was like, I was like, guys, like I didn't misunderstand anything that you were saying. I come from England where that movement started, like the whole garden cities movement, industrial system of education, decentralized, you know, uh, public surveillance. But that's something that ETH developers are talking about. Like Vitalik himself was pumping Claros, you know, like the decentralized court system. So it's, the, the, there's this like ideology that's like deeply inside of ETH core, which is disconnected from the like kind of cypherpunk will of the community. And that's why I kind of see the community kind of pulling away and like killing its old, old master. But it's, it's still kind of very mixed up, these trends, like, because there's that the solar punk imaginary, which Rose can talk more about, which is, is, is very much based around this authoritarian vision of the future where, you know, where you still have like mega cities, except there's just like more trees, you know, we use solar panels, but it's still like the same apparatus that we live in. And like, and, and the problem is, is that, the, the technology as it's being conceptualized now is, is dominantly first world. And, uh, you know, people who, they kind of like, they like live in the system and, you know, they just want, maybe want to tweak the system a bit, but they don't fundamentally want to like change the system. They're like, actually, they, they, they think it's pretty okay. But the flip side of that is a system where, you know, 2 million people were killed in Iraq and Syria over the last like 10 years to, to fund like our oil extraction so that we can, we can continue the industrial society where, uh, you know, people, common people now, even it used to be brown people. Now it's actually, and then it was the Greeks and the Spanish, but now it's actually like people in the US them, themselves, like, you know, the, the hyperinflation event that we're all expecting to come. It's like, it's like now it's like they've extracted all the resources from all the world, but now the only resource left is, there, is, the, is the people directly under them. And so their position of power is getting more unstable. And the only kind of flip side they have to that is to authoritarianism. And as Rose alluded to, the problem of capture of the technology is where blockchain actually becomes the means for this, this new authoritarian technology, which, you know, uh, CBDCs, they're trying to give incentive for people to move over. And one of the main Ethereum projects now people keep talking about is UBI, universal basic income. The only way to make universal basic income work is if we have identity on the blockchain. And that's why everybody keeps talking about identity, you know, quadratic voting. So this is the idea that everybody is identified on the blockchain and managed by this central system, which drops credit to people. And UBI is a, is a centralized shitcoin fiat airdrop to incentivize people to move to CBDCs, which, you know, before we used to have this, this network of local community banks, and now community banks are being pushed out of existence. And that, that financial infrastructure is being centralized to a few. In England, we only have five high street banks, you know, Lloyds, Barclays, NatWest, etc. Uh, but now they want to get rid of those banks. So now the only person who will issue credit will be the central bank, literally just be a website, your bank account will be a web, a, like literally an account on the on the web server running at, at the European central bank. And they will just go beep, issue more credits, beep. And, you know, they're, they're deeply inspired by the Chinese model, which they're like, you know, they're like, they, we brought China into WF in the 90s because they're like, 
oh, the Chinese will become more democratic, they'll become more peace-loving and free, freedom-loving. But it didn't happen. China is like just doing China. And like, yeah, China, authoritarianism's cool, capitalism's cool. And then, uh, and, but then now they're creating this social credit system where they like incentivize people who have good behaviors. If you're like not late to meetings, if you only associate with good people, you know, you get like incentives, you get benefits through their system and they allow you to get like cheaper train tickets or, or better rent. The, the, the Western states, they're looking, they're looking at the Chinese system and they go, cool, that is a, that's a really interesting idea. We should copy that. That's, that's what the whole UBI, CBDC thing is about. And the problem is that if, as an intellectual culture, a lot of this if elite now, they're, they're trying to conceptualize, oh yeah, how do we create this court system? How do we create this uh, identity? How do we create this form, this vision of the future, but using blockchain so it's decentralized? So it's like harder for people to like attack it. You know, so but then the other vision of technology is the stuff that we've been talking about this whole kind of episode, and it's and it's all the DeFi and DAO stuff. You know, like raising twenty million to free Assange from prison. You know, to fight the system. You know, to uh, give to the Russell Brick campaign. You know, cypherpunks freeing cypherpunks. It's like we've become a power. Like we have negotiating power now. We have, and you know. The biggest hedge fund in the world, Renaissance Technologies, you know, uh, Robert Mercer. Robert Mercer, he's the guy that uh, funded uh, Cambridge Analytica. He's the guy that funded uh, uh, Brexit. He funded Trump. He put Trump in touch with Bannon. That was Robert Mercer, who is the chairman of the biggest hedge fund in the world, Renaissance Technologies. They, they figured out how to use their financial power for political power. And now Steve Bannon is leading a coup supported by Cambridge Analytica on, on Europe. Essentially, all these like European states like Vox and Austria and so on, they're going towards right-wing neo-feudalism. They're doing that with under, under this uh, fed, federation that Bannon's created. And that's all funded and supported by Robert Mercer. So, like, as, so we are the cypherpunks. We are a new, new economic class. We're, you know, like... The amount of money that's being moved through Asia, through Asian markets, every single day, like capital flight, going through USD Teva, all the crypto organizations, like the level of sophistication in this market compared to 2013 is like on a whole other level. Like, you know, we have people are using law now, people are using tech, we have so much tech tools. The people, are like, also everybody is so mobile uh, and they're like going to Africa, they're going to. Uh, do really dodgy places like El Salvador. That was started because a guy just started setting up ATM machines. So this is like a community with vitality, which uh, with entrepreneurialism, you know, with with drive and ambition that's exploring. And so that's that's the vision of tech that we see. Like let's you know that's like our our, our power that we have that we have leverage to be a new class to enact this this economic political vision that we have. You know, we're technologists. You know, we're, we're finance people with the intersection of philosophy, economics, and technology, the three big movers of human history. Yeah, I was going to let Rose uh, uh, talk about um, what, I was, what I was saying earlier about the uh, solar punk and lunar punk imaginaries. So uh, Amir alluded to, um, you know, the, the importance of that solar punk has for a lot of people in Ethereum. Um, you know, and he described it as authoritarian. I think it definitely has authoritarian tendencies. Although if you speak with solar punks, um, many of them are not, um, uh, many of them aren't aware of that. And they, they see themselves as being more this kind of like um, neo-socialist kind of paradigm. But by virtue of their um, transparency and their um, insistence on identity and um, they've basically integrated authoritarianism into their systems um, so quadratic voting and gitcoin is a perfect example of this gitcoin is a project which is openly solar punk they talk about solar punk all the time um, but they in order to do quadratic voting needed to have identity so for that they use github uh, as we know and just recently 
um, they blocked all grant proposals from people speaking Farsi because of U.S. sanctions against Iran. Um, so this is the logic of surveillance and authoritarianism playing out like uh, in like the immediate present. Uh, but the but the but the downstream of that is potentially worse. Um, so Darkfy is is you know is proposing a kind of counter proposal which we call lunar punk, um, which is um, correcting. Um, the authoritarian tendencies in solar punk, uh, essentially through anonymity, um, but also through an insistence on uh, ideology um, and uh, and philosophy, um, instead of this kind of absence of ideas, which you know typically is just a backdoor for uh, from for the liberal ideology, um, uh, which you know I think eth- Ethereum has fallen victim to. So lunar punk, you know, it's it's its symbols are things more like forests as opposed to the solar punk desert, which you know it, its central symbol is the sun, um, which is again this kind of dual meaning of both a symbol of nature but also one of tyranny and surveillance. So so lunar punks, uh, you know, inhabit these kind of more liminal dark spaces, um, which uh, more, are more like a forest, you know, that protect inhabitants and. Uh, offer sanctuary then to, to people who are persecuted and also provide a line of defense, um, which is, which is really, um, critical. Um, and, and this kind of, this vision that we're talking about, uh, you, you can see it in the solar punk imagery. If you just Google solar punk on, on Google images, I mean, it's maybe kind of a simplified version of what I think some of the people in ETH are talking about. It's very Dubai-esque. So you basically have these mega structures, the, the, um, which have now grass around them. So the implication is we have a future where capitalism and, um, and in industry have been preserved basically intact, but we now also have trees and grasses, etc., cetera, which, uh, you know, imply that we've corrected the climate crisis through um, planting trees or something. Um, but the fundamental issue at hand here, you know, which is uh, through our analysis, you know, industry itself, like hasn't been addressed um, it's re- it's remained intact. The reason why I think solar punk is attractive to many people uh, and to people in Ethereum is because it is optimistic, but also because it offers a vision of the future uh, in a, at a time where the future feels increasingly closed off, um, and in a time where you know apocalyptic narratives are are the most dominant. Um, so solar punk is refreshing to people because it says actually we can you can use technology to solve these problems and so we can have a better future etc. You know so that's not it's not bad that people are wanting to to see the future they're wanting to to imagine a better outcome. Um, uh, so so with lunar punk and with dark fire we're, we're also trying to in, offer people a way to like envision the future like to to speculate on other futures which are better than this one. Um, but without falling into the trap of like tyrannical systems as Solarpunk does. Cool. Well, I would say let's let's wrap up at this point. Uh, we've gone like super long, but this was like really amazing. I really enjoyed this conversation. I think we like covered so many different things. Yeah. But so thanks so much everyone for coming on. I'm sure there will be people who are like interested in getting involved in uh, in the community. Say, I wish I could just listen to Amir talk about history, like, just for hours on end, because I think that was just the best part. Yeah, then thanks so much, everyone. It was a, it was a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, thank you. And apologies, we didn't talk more about tech, but we have an Elements channel. We're going to put out more documentation, you know, over time. So, you know, we also have a lot of to say about technology stuff. It's our life. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks so much, Guy. Real pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.